God wants to use us and move through us. How do we not get caught up in the rat race of life? I'm going to play a little short clip, Ethan. I'm going to play a little short clip. Get old Dolly Parton. <laughs> Sing along if you like. No, I'm not coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just in case. I was thinking nine till five. Wow, that's a short day, isn't it? <laughs> Eight till ten is a bit, it's a bit more. <laughs> no, that's too long for a Simon Field day. <laughs> ten till two. <laughs> Being generous, I know. <laughs> God's really been speaking to me a lot over this whole work-life balance type thing. And how do, I, how do I make the most of God in my life? There's a way which we can live, I believe, where by even though we're busy, and I've mentioned this on a couple of times before, we can still operate from a place of rest. Even though we've got hectic schedules and people to see and things to do and works, work placements to fill, there's still a way of living where we work from where Jesus is so that it's still a rested work. And, and for me, sometimes I get that and other times I'm frantically running around and by the end of it, I'm whew, exhausted. And other times I can come through the end of the day and just think, wow, you know, God, it was just a, it was busy and yet there was a difference about it. So let's have a, a quick look at Jesus now. There's not a lot said about Jesus up until the age of around 30. We see him appearing as a kid in the temple, confounding the religious elite. But we begin to pick up that he was probably some kind of labourer, some kind of craftsman, workman. Traditionally, we give him uh, the title of a carpenter. So in Matthew 13... 53, it says, when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue. So he went to church and he began to speak to them and preach to them through the Bible so that they were astonished. The way that he spoke, he spoke with wisdom, authority, something supernatural was the way he communicated. Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this... The carpenter's son. Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And so what, what the writer in, in Matthew is getting at, he's saying, you know, look, Jesus, to those around him, was an ordinary guy. He had an ordinary job. He was a, a tecton, is the Greek word. He was a craftsman. He potentially could have been a stonemason, not actually a carpenter, but in a sense it doesn't really matter. But he worked with his hands. He had a job that he needed to fulfill. And yet at the same time, there was something different about him. They could see he was an ordinary guy with an ordinary family, brothers and sisters and mother and father. And on the other side of it, he lived and operated in a supernatural way. And, and to the point where they kind of are so confounded by it that they actually think, well, I'm not even going to go to this guy because he must just be an ordinary guy. Yeah, there's something about him, but I'm not going to give my life to understanding who this guy is. I'm going to go my own way. And it says that not many people 
were healed, were impacted by the kingdom of God because of it. Their, their mind was offended by him. He, their, their natural mind could only see him as an ordinary man. They couldn't see that he carried something within his ordinary life that they needed. And for me, that's a, that's a challenge is if I am doing an ordinary task, so for example, I've got to get the, get the groceries, I'm, I'm whipping on out to wherever Sainsbury's, Tesco's, Morrison's, better plug them all just in case, Asda, Waitrose, whatever everyone's there are, M&S, co-op. <laughs> As I'm going about this ordinary task, and this is something we've been trying to think about over these last few weeks, am I so in tune with what God is saying and, in the ho- and with the Holy Spirit that I'm still available to respond to whatever he asks of me? Am I so fixed on my nine till five, working hard to make a living? Yeah. Or am I available in the moment of the tasks and the work that I need to do to, to offer something of Jesus to the people that I'm coming in contact with. Matthew tells us that Jesus wanted to impact people's lives, yet people wouldn't come to him because they didn't see it. And I think sometimes we are like those religious people where we almost compartmentalize our lives, where we say, Jesus is for this bit. He's here for me on a, on a Sunday morning when we gather. You know, he's, but I've got to leave him at the house when I go down the pub to meet my mates. We come part and we have a Jesus slot. It might, we even may even do a midweek group if we're super spiritual. We come connect groups. But then when we go out for the next day to, get, to fill up the car with the petrol, well, Jesus is at the house. Jesus, just make yourself comfortable. Get yourself a biscuit, drink. Mi casa, you casa. Use the fridge. I'll be back in a moment. You can't come with me to here. <laughs> and maybe we don't make that kind of obvious distinction. But I think sometimes we do that. And then we come back, oh, Jesus, we welcome you. You're more beautiful than anything else to me. And he's going, but why are you so embarrassed with me that you wouldn't take me to even get your car filled up? Oh. Yeah, oh, yeah. And yet God is wanting us to be alive in the Spirit of God on a 24-7 basis where we are not ashamed of who he is where we boldly live out the truth of our faith and our relationship with Jesus. In the book of Mark, he picks up on this idea of Jesus as a, a carpenter in Mark 6. Verse 1, it says, Went from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, potentially a similar account, the same account to Matthew. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? So not just the carpenter's son, but he's the carpenter. He was also the the craftsman. He was still laboring with his hands. The son of Mary and brother of James and, and, and Joseph and Judas and Simon. When was the last time? Someone came to you and me and were astonished <laughs> by the clothes. That, no. But they were astonished by the wisdom and the love and the power of God that emanated from our being. When was the last time that someone said, wait a minute, there's something profoundly different about you and I don't know what it is. But there's something that I just need to find out what is going on. And this is not for us to sit here and think, oh man, I'm a bad Christian. That never happens to me. I, I don't want to guilt you or make you feel bad, bad about anything. What I want us to see this morning above anything else is how much we are loved. That we are loved beyond measure that we have a God that pursues us endlessly, that we have a God that who in relationship with changes the atmosphere of the lives that we live. And there is nothing more beautiful than that. It is not condemnation that is going to change us to live for Jesus and love him more. It's the love that we experience from him. It's giving that time and that opportunity to experience God in a real and life-transforming way that will make that change. 
And as we looked at this life of Jesus and we try to understand who this Jesus is, that we saw, yes, he was fully God, but as he came down to earth, he laid aside his divine power and became fully man, still fully God, fully man, but operated in the power of the Holy Spirit to show us how you and I can live with the tension of our crazy lives and with our ears and our eyes open to heaven at the same time. And I believe God is looking for a people that are so bowled over, so impacted, so broken down by the credible love that God has for us, that we live with that tension on a daily basis. That we see God move powerfully. There's so many scriptures that talk about us, how we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to do everything as unto the glory of God. Colossians 3. says this in verse 12 put on then as God's chosen ones holy and beloved compassionate hearts kindness humility meekness and patience bearing with one another and if one has a complaint against another forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive and above all this put on love above all these other virtues and these lifestyle choices, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ, we live from a place of rest, of peace, of shalom, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called, in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Do you see the words that, that Paul is writing to this church here? That he's, he's not mincing them. He's not kind of playing it down again. You know, being a Christian's okay. It's all right. It's fine. You know, you know, sometimes I get a little fuzzy buzz, but, you know, it's all right. He's using terms of, you know, when you put on love, when you put on Jesus Christ, when you absorb and are completely immersed in him, the love becomes everything. We live and move and love as he does so that Christ... His word, Jesus alive in us, becomes rich to us. Teaching and admonishing, helping each other along, one another in all wisdom. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether that's things you say or whether actions you take part in, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. God's peace rests in our hearts. We work from a place of rest that richly he fills our lives so that day by day there is something that is significant. Our souls are like being fed in a, in a deep and rich way so that we're fully satisfied so that other people can see Jesus. Flip over to 2 Timothy. It's a little bit further on in your Bibles. It's after 1 Timothy just in case. <laughs> Page 1197 in my Bible. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We're going to come back to this idea that God pours out his grace, his faith in us. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules it's the hard working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops think over what I say for the Lord will give you understanding in everything and there's this tension of us working hard for God and this tension between being available to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying in that moment. And we have to live within that tension so that Jesus is seen more, more visibly through our lives. It goes on in chapter 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by the appearing and his kingdom preach the word be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. 
For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and waft, wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And there's this urge as we look at the, as we have this like army, the soldiers that are going out in battle. He's urging us. He's saying you're going to come across tough times. There are going to be times where things don't make sense and life's just a bit crazy. But don't lose heart. Don't get distracted. Don't allow that to weigh you down. There's a richness that is found in God that will take us through. There's a, there's a passion that we can find that's not planted in any other pursuit that we have. You know, we may love golf, or we might like football, or we may be into artwork, or we might be into DIY, and they things might bubble away in us, and they are God-given, but there's a, there's a passion that is directed rightly at Jesus Christ that enables us to satisfy us in a way that nothing else can. So that when we come across difficulties and troubles and hardships, it actually uses us to push us deeper into Jesus rather than us running away from him and blaming everything on the church. God is, is so in love with us and so wants us to understand how much he's given for us and how rich he wants our lives to be. Because in that fullness and from his fullness, we all receive grace upon grace so that we can extend that fullness of grace to those around us. 1 Peter, chapter 3. Again, a little bit further on in your Bibles. In verse 13 it says, Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? We have a lot of passion towards things, but towards God it's good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts honour Christ, the Lord is holy. Always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile you, your good behaviour in Christ, may be put to shame. For it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So he's saying we're still responsible for our actions, even if people come against us, even if people criticise us, even if people verbally or physically hurt us, we can still forgive. That means don't hold it to ourselves and allow bitterness to grow. And still find rest and fullness in God in the midst of it. When he is our everything, when God is the most beautiful thing in our life, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks or says or does. And this is a lesson I'm trying to learn. This is a lesson that I'm asking the Holy Spirit to show me and teach me and make alive in me. Because like most people, I still get hurt by things that people say and do. And yet my desire is to be so committed, so surrendered, so yielded to Jesus that nothing else makes a difference. And I believe that's what it takes for the church to be effective and to look like Jesus. So Jesus showed us what total surrender looked like. In the midst of his busy job, he was not just a carpenter, a labourer. He was also a rabbi, a teacher, a preacher. He had people that followed him, that hung around with him, that literally ran along behind him under, their, under his feet even. And he would have to have expanded to them scriptures and taught them and tried to help them understand how to apply it in life. And yet he's juggling these things and yes, he probably stepped away from his labouring business, but the Bible looks like they still did bits and pieces. Peter still fished. Uh, Luke was still a physician. They still had jobs and ministry. And yet Jesus was still alive in everything that they did. The, 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 Jesus showed us what a yielded life looks like through the power of the Holy Spirit. That in the busyness, God is seen most profoundly. What are you, how are you compartmentalizing your life? How are you placing God in a box and not taking him other places? You know, I was out with um, Paul and Karen, me and Lucy had a lovely meal with them this week, and, and there was a lady, a group of us, a group of them next to us, and a guy introduced this lady to me and said he's the pastor of this church, and they asked this question, and they said, so what does it mean to be an evangelical church? And it, I was... I was thrown for a moment. I, I'll be honest. I was thrown for a moment. I'm, I'm told that I need to be ready. <laughs> be ready to give an answer. 
wait a minute, you preach on a Sunday, how could you not have an answer? And I was just like, what, would you, what, um, what does evangelical mean? Uh. <laughs> God taught me a lesson there. And I did end up engaging in conversation and explain things to her. Be ready. Be so in tune with the Holy Spirit, so devoted to him, so bowled over by his presence and his love that as soon as someone speaks, bam! The words just come because it's the Holy Spirit speaking. This is what Jesus showed us. He would go around all the streets and the villages and people would come up to him, people that were caught in adultery, and he just knew what to say straight away. People would come up to him covered in leprosy, you know, messed up bodies, and God would, he would just straight away lay hands on them. This same lady, I missed an opportunity and I'm really, I grieved over it, but I've given it to God. And she, just as she was leaving, she said something about her spine. I don't know if you guys picked up on it. And I heard it for a split second and she was gone out the door. And I heard God say to me, pray for her. But she'd gone out the door and I thought, oh, it's too late now. My desire is that I'm so in tune with the Spirit that in that split moment of a second that someone crosses by and I'll say, can I pray for you? Because I believe God will heal. And I'm learning, just like the rest of us, just to listen to the voice of God. And it, you know where there's that passage where, where, where God's Jesus' disciples are trying to cast out all these uh, demons and, and they just can't do it. And Jesus goes up to him and he says, these only come out through prayer and fasting. What, what he wasn't saying to them, he wasn't saying what you need to do is you need to go away and you need to not eat for a day or two. And then come and pray for these guys. That's not what he was saying. What he was saying is you need a lifestyle. A lifestyle that is of prayer and fasting. A lifestyle of sacrifice. The reason why it tells us that to count the cost and that passage where it says about running a race and an athlete runs and all these kinds of things is because we are to sacrifice everything that we are and every dream that we have. That, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It means that I will say, I give up everything, as the disciples did. He says they left their nets and they followed Jesus. It's me saying, I give up the rights to absolutely everything in my life. I hold on to nothing and any desire or pursuit I have, I hand over to you. That doesn't sound great, does it? And yet God gives you new dreams and pursuits. And some of them might tie into the ones you've already got. But there's fulfillment in it now, rather than just a temporary pleasure that just comes and goes each day. So we're looking for the next fix and the next fix and the next fix. And if, I'm gonna, if we're going to be a church that lives in the fullness of God, it says to us, will I sacrifice everything that I am and have for you, Jesus? That means I, don't, I no longer put you in a box in anywhere in my life. And I'm willing to give up everything, let go of anything, go anywhere, do anything you ask of me. And I will live in that on a daily basis so that I'm in tune with the Holy Spirit. And you know the amazing thing about it is, it is probably the, okay, let me rephrase that. It is the most fulfilling way to live. It is the most exciting way to live. It is the most life-changing way to live. It's the most kingdom-impacting, Jesus-glorifying way to live. And Christianity, following Jesus, is not boring. You know, talking about giving up everything sounds kind of crazy, but yet the Bible tells us that we gain everything. We gain Christ, who is everything. The one who richly fills our lives. And there's this challenge to us. Will we be a people that are ready, that are walking on a day-by-day -day basis in the presence of God? God is looking for a church that walks by faith, not by sight. Because in Hebrews 11, it tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Enoch, it goes through this crazy... I've been meditating on Hebrews 11 over this week. And you just, if you just get to read some of these guys and what it says about them... And I love what it says about Enoch, where it says he got taken up to heaven. He had this faith in God that he didn't actually die. His body didn't go into a grave, but he gets teleported, transported into heaven. Why? Because it said his faith pleased God. He lived in a way that it pleased God. And, you know, simplistic way of living is faithful living. It's a faith way of living. It's not saying, I've got this problem. How am I going to work it out? It's saying, Jesus, I've got this problem. What's the answer? There's a different 
a subtle shift from, I need to sort something out, I need to work this out, I need to control this, I need to make it happen, to stepping back and saying, Jesus, what is the answer? And I won't do anything unless I get an answer from you. What a way to live. You know what? It would probably mean that we would feel so much more at peace. We wouldn't be so busy with the crazy running after stuff that ends up in nothing. But we'd have the answer from God and we would know that even when we're stepping into that answer, even if we're not seeing things happen directly straight away, we have faith and trust in God that we're stepping on his path and that he will bring it through to fruition. See, there's a lot of us that have kind of passionate lives, faith-filled lives. But God wants it all to be directed to him. As I, I love this, um, this passage in Acts 12. If you've got your Bible, and the story so far is that Peter is in prison. And, uh, you know, he's been rocking Jesus. And so he's been imprisoned. And the, 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 the Christians are praying for him. And they're, they're praying in this house fervently, this, you know, wanting God to, to break him free. <laughs> Verse 12, Acts 12. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary. So he's, he's been brought out of prison, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So Peter's going off. He's been broken out of prison by this angel. So he's going to go and talk to the people that have been praying for him. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. <laughs> but she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying it is an angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. <laughs> what a crazy story. Faith enables us to see what God is doing. So what I love about that story is you've got this group of Christians that are praying for Peter to come. <laughs> just, just, just get this a minute. This is almost a joke. You could probably make it into a comedy sketch, really. They're praying for Jesus to come and break Peter out. And when he knocks at the door, they're literally praying as he's knocking. <laughs> and the, the, the girl Rhoda runs up to it Oh, she hears Peter's voice, runs back in. It's Peter, it's Peter. You're crazy, he's in prison. What do you think our prayers? They don't work. <laughs> yeah, we've been praying, we've been fasting, we've been believing. <laughs> and Peter turns up and they miss it. <laughs> Craziness. Craziness. And I just realized, wow, are there are things that I'm praying for at times. And I'm trying to walk in step with the Spirit. And I'm trying to listen to respond when people speak to. And yet when God turns up, I miss it. Faith enables us to see what he's doing and being ready to respond as he moves. Let's not be like these guys who pray for something when God turns up. We believe that it's not really it. We, we were at a CPI meeting, which is a church planting meeting, and one of the guys gave um, the story of the blanket that was held out for Peter, and in the same, same time, he goes, oh man, I can't eat those things, it's not clean, the food on it. You know, I've never eaten a pig's hoof. You know, I can't eat this one now. And God says to him, what I've made unclean, you know, don't call, what I've made clean, don't call unclean. Sometimes God turns up and answers our prayers in a way that we weren't expecting. Yet if we are in tune with God, if we are available to the Holy Spirit, we will see it. There is no shortcuts in this, by the way. There is no shortcuts to work, walking and living in this way. There is no way that we can just kind of sneak in around the edge. It requires total devotion to Jesus. Now, I'm, me and John used to go to college together and I remember going different ways and occasionally we got to college, didn't we? <laughs> I don't know why, but when we started going to college, I always had this idea that we needed to go another way. We'd end up down, did we end up at Portland once or at Corf Mullen? I don't know. We ended up in various places, possibly fishing at times. I, I love Bible college. I, I, yeah, I mean, get all my theology from there. So. <laughs> but what I realized is uh, John would come to a traffic jam and I go, John, don't worry, I know a shortcut. <laughs> the journey's normally, they say, two hours. Four hours later. <laughs> Four hours later, I turn up. John, no shocker. We ended up at a pub or something on the way. I don't know. Something. I don't know. These things happen. But 
But I believe it's the same with our faith. There are no shortcuts. You know, what happens is God says, go this way. And we go, no, God, I know a shortcut. I know a better way. Yeah, I know you're God of the universe and you're awesome and you know everything. Yeah, I know better this time. <laughs> and what happens is, is we end up tracking around and around and around. And, and God says, man, if you just followed my way, <laughs> you would just be there right now. And I just feel that God is saying to us that he's opening up doors. He's wanting to reveal more of himself to us. He's encouraging us to trust him implicitly, to surrender everything and go on his journey, not ours. Be ready through your faith eyes to when God responds that you're ready to see it and act with what he's asking you to do. Luke, in Luke 1, another lo- I love this story too, highlights the same thing. We've got to have our eyes open to see what God is doing. Luke 1, verse 8. Now while he was serving as priest as Zechariah, God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside of the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on. And basically tells him about him about to have this, this kid, this son. Verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? How on earth am I going to have this kid? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. <laughs> yeah, you might go in the temple now and again. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. That's my, that's my criteria. That's my, <laughs> I'm the one that stands there. Zachariah goes, oh man, I wish I never said that. <laughs> I've come to bring you good news. Verse 20, behold, you will be silent. <laughs> you missed it, boy. So now you're going to be silent and able to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words. How often do we miss what God is doing? We don't believe his words for us. He speaks truth over us and yet we think there's another way, there's a better way. Think of Abraham with Isaac and Ishmael and all this kind of craziness that we do as Christians. When will we come to our senses and realize that God does actually know what he's doing? As hard as it might be to believe, he knows what he's doing. He has the best intention for us. A surrendered life to God is one that is most fulfilled. And the problem is, is we still don't believe it. We still don't believe he's the beautiful one. We still don't believe that he is the great I am. So we say, okay, God, I'm just going to do it my way for a little bit because to give you full control is too scary because I'm still not sure you're good. And yet God loves and he is good and he's faithful and trustworthy. And you know, many of us have gone through difficult backgrounds. We may have lost trust in people through situations and circumstances. Yet I want to say to you this morning, through the power and the presence of God, that he is trustworthy. He is the way, the truth, and the life. His very essence is truth. You can trust him with your life. He's the way. He's the way to everything, to the Father, to life, to to success, to understanding, to relationships, to everything that we are. And he's life. If you want to know what life and living really is, gain Jesus. Have him as your number one. Faith enables us to see what God is doing and to step and walk in line with him. See, if we can, be, we can be really faithful, passionate, zealous people, but unless it's directed at Jesus, it's just hard effort. You can go out and you can tell people about Jesus. You can preach on a Sunday. You can lead worship. You can run a small group. You can run a, a, a connect group. You could be doing a toddler group. You could be doing all these amazing things for Jesus, and you may be passionate about them, but if that passion is for them and not Jesus, it's just effort. And it's that subtle shift again away from being passionate about what we do to being passionate about the one in whom we love and live for. And that's what God wants from us, to have a passionate heart for him. And you know, in that place, when we surrender all, he gives us 
this gift of faith. Romans 12 talks about this idea that he gives us gifts in proportion to our faith. That he releases blessings upon our lives according to how much we trust in him. And the more that we surrender, the more that we trust, the more faith will be given to us. One of the things I'm praying for a lot at the moment is that God will give me a gift of faith so that I pray from heaven and not earth. So that I see from heaven and not earth. And that not only would he give me that gift of faith, but that as he does, I will obediently follow it up. So there's no point in us saying, God, give me a gift of faith so I can go and preach to people on the streets or pray for those people who are sick. And then saying, yeah, just give me a gift of faith. Oh, thank you for that gift. And then sit in there. And then, oh, Lord God, I just need that gift of faith. Then I'll go. And then, oh, thank you for that gift of faith. And then we just sit there. And he's going, I'm not going to give you any more faith because you're going to explode unless you give some of it away. <laughs> and God wants to fill us up like a stream that continuously filled and being poured out in service and in love to others. And so that as we ask God, fill us with that gift of faith so we see as you do, so I can walk as you do, so I can respond as you do. We have to go and do something with it. We have to release it. We have to let it go. And in that place of surrender, we become a channel where God's presence and his spirit flows through us and impacts the people around us. Hebrews 11. I'm going to finish soon, don't worry. But only if the Holy Spirit tells me. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And he goes on to talk about Abel and Enoch and all these other people that by faith were able to see the impossible take place. And their faith, please God, they became those channels in their busy and hectic life. And sometimes we look at these guys and we think, it was all right, all they ever did was just spoke about Jesus and son Jesus. They didn't have families, they didn't have work, and they didn't have pressures, and they didn't have social groups. Of course they did. Their lives were hectic and busy. And yet by faith they became channels so that where God had placed them, whether you're a CEO of a corporation or whether you go to school and are learning at college, you still become a channel of the Holy Spirit so that God is poured out into people's lives. And he will then invest more in us and more is poured out. Therefore, chapter 12, since we are surrounded by these incredible great witnesses, Time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead, for by the resurrection... Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Every dream, every passion, every desire, everything that is contrary towards the love we should have for God. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. Faith enables us to see Jesus more clearly. The founder and perfecter of our faith. That means that he started it. The founder of any organization is the person that dreamt up the idea and came up with it. Do you know his church, that's you and me, or his idea? He's the founder of it. But not just that, he's the perfecter. He's the one that enables us to be the church if we will surrender ourselves to him. Perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God everything that we see everything that we have read the way that God loves and lives through human beings you and I is what he wants for this church he doesn't want us just to put him in a box on a Sunday and not take him to the pub when we're meeting our mates. He wants to be everything to us because when he's at everything, we are most free 
and effective and the passion and the zeal that we have is directed towards his purposes. And they always accomplish what they were set out to do. This is my prayer. I'm going to finish with this in Acts 26. This is what I pray that we will be as a church that balances this crazy life, that surrenders fully to him, that becomes channels of the Holy Spirit to those around us that are ready in season and out of season. This is what I want to speak over us. 26.16 But rise and stand upon your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose. To appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen and to those in which will appear to you. To open their eyes. This is those around us, those that don't know God. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to God. And they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's the commission that God has for us, to stand up, to go, so that eyes may be open and people plucked from hell into life. Let's pray.